Hello and welcome to our webinar, Authors and Arcs, Part One. I'm Donna Seaman, Adult Books Editor at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. Links to today's slide presentation and title list were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the links located there. You can also download the slides and title list by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions and we'll pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Last but not least, Booklist offers closed captioning on all our webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the live transcript icon on the toolbar mentioned above. From there, you can select show or hide subtitles from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the captions at any time by selecting subtitle settings. All right, yes, here's our panelists. Today we have the pleasure of hearing from Megan Edwards, author of A Coin for the Ferryman from Imbifex Books. Tony Shiloh, author of In Search of a Prince from Bethany House Publishers. Erin Bartles, author of The Girl Who Could Breathe Underwater from Ravel. Mecca Jamila Sullivan, author of Big Girl from Live Right, a division of W.W. Norton and Company. Shelby Van Pelt, author of Remarkably Bright Creatures from Echo Press, an imprint of HarperCollins Publishers, and Virginia Stanley, Director of Library Marketing at HarperCollins Publishers. We will begin this webinar with some author and title presentations, then we will move on to an author panel. So here's Megan Edwards. Megan is the author of a forthcoming novel, A Coin for the Ferryman. Her other books include the travel memoir, Roads from the Ashes, an Odyssey in Real Life on the Virtual Frontier, the humor book, Caution, Funny Signs Ahead, the award-winning Copper Black Mystery Novels, Getting Off on Frank Sinatra and Full Service Blonde, also the award-winning novel, Strings, A Love Story. Edward told a BA in Classics from Scripps College and an MA from Claremont Graduate University. She has lived and traveled extensively in Europe and spent nearly seven years on the road all over North America. Now at home in Las Vegas, Nevada, she is working on her next book. Thanks for joining us today, Megan. Thank you so much for having me. I guess I'll start. I'll begin by saying that this book, A Coin for the Ferryman, is one of those novels that really took its time to enter the world. Perhaps it's not surprising since the story itself has a really long timeline, beginning on the Ides of March 44 BCE and not ending until 2020, the 2020 of our era. I do remember, however, when the idea for the tale first occurred to me. Next slide, please. I was here at the Getty Villa in Malibu, California a remarkably faithful replica of an ancient villa in Herculaneum that was destroyed when Mount Vesuvius erupted, it has been one of my favorite museums since my days as a classics major at Scripps College and later when I taught beginning Latin to middle schoolers in Los Angeles. But it was on my first visit that I wondered to myself, what would a real ancient Roman think of this? Because so much would be familiar and some things would be so bizarre like the parking garage, the elevators, the electric lights. The pretty blue chlorinated pools would be weird too. This question became my go-to thought experiment and in time, a novel was born. Next slide, please. Of course, it had to be a time travel story. Many such yarns involve a person or persons from the present journeying back to the past. Mine, of course, had to be one of the other kind, a tale where a person from the past comes to the present. I had already decided that I wanted to get an ancient Roman, so the one big question that remained was, which one? 
Next slide, please. I picked Julius Caesar. My thought experiment immediately expanded from what would a Roman think about a chlorinated pond to what goes on inside the head of the most famous general the world has ever known? Daunting, yes. And I had a lot of research to do. Julius Caesar lived 2000 years ago, but much is known about his life and career thanks to his own writing and the work of others. And of course there's Shakespeare who lived much later, but whose play forms much of our current images of the man. Next slide, please. I came up with the team that would create the mechanism by which Caesar would be transported. Here are the members, each with their own personal histories that will affect the experiment and its outcome. A Caltech Nobel laureate with a lifetime interest in time travel, his assistant, also a physicist, a world-class epidemiologist, we needed a, med a medical person to deal with those possible issues, a classic scholar whose best-selling book, what would Julius Caesar do is being made into a series for the History Channel. And a second classic scholar with a strong background in Latin literature and history. Next slide, please. There were two more team members, both vital to the project's rollout. The patroness who is funding the secret project and the undergraduate who can speak Latin fluently. The patroness is a woman originally from Costa Rica whose late husband was an innovative engineer and uber wealthy founder of a global engineering firm. Even though her husband has died, she is committed to supporting the project. The undergraduate is a young woman from Las Vegas who has recently moved to Los Angeles to be a classics major at USC. Thanks to her high school Latin teacher, she speaks Latin fluently. Thanks to her years spent working as a cocktail waitress on the Las Vegas Strip, she has other skills as well. Next slide, please. Here are the goals of the AIDS project. Grab Caesar moments before his assassination on the Ides of March. Keep him for four days in a specially constructed and secret lab. Send him back to the moment from which he was snatched. Simple, right? Well, perhaps it should have been. The team did its best to think of every possible exigency. Even so, things did not go as planned. While Julius Caesar never did visit the Getty Villa, he did venture beyond the confines of the lab. Next slide, please. You knew this was coming, right? Yes, Julius Caesar did visit Caesar's palace. This of course meant that I had to visit Caesar's palace. When I first began writing this novel, I knew very little about Las Vegas beyond the ubiquitous stereotypes. Since one of my main characters was a Las Vegas local, born and raised, it didn't take me long to realize that I would have to go to Las Vegas and find out what it's like to grow up in, quote unquote, Sin City. So here's a little personal backstory. In 1999, I was living in a motorhome with my husband. We had been living and traveling on the road all over North America for six years, ever since our home and business burned in a California wildfire. Let's go to Las Vegas, I said. We can stay for a few weeks. I'll find out everything I need to know, and then we can go somewhere else because of course we wouldn't like it. And of course we wouldn't want to stay. Next slide, please. This conversation took place 20 years ago. We are still in Las Vegas. I think when you pause to take a closer look at something, you run the chance of actually liking it. The Las Vegas I discovered as I rode the buses and found the neighborhood where my protagonist lived and went to school was nothing like what I expected. I was looking for authenticity and what I found was my new home. If someone had told me when I first left California that I would drive all over the continent and then put down roots in Southern Nevada, I would have said impossible anywhere but Vegas. But it happened and this book is the reason. A couple more small notes. I found my first agent with the first version of this novel. The book almost sold, it didn't. So I put it on a shelf and went on to write three other books. I never forgot this one though. And I kept working on it as the years passed. Now at last, it has grown into the story I had always hoped I could tell. I couldn't be happier that it is now making its way out into the world. One of my biggest fears was that I might create a ridiculous Caesar one that classicists with far greater experience and knowledge than I would scorn. When you decide to travel inside the head of a warrior statesman from two millennia ago, 
one that is recognized and revered the world over, it's a daunting journey. I also knew there would come a day when I would have to put my creation in front of the very people whose books and research I had used to create him. Scary stuff. So imagine my excitement when Professor Tatum wrote what he read, wrote that he read the book in a weekend, unable to put it down. And his was one of the books that I used quite extensively during my research. Next slide, please. I was thrilled to receive a number of other endorsements from classic scholars, including Greg Wolf, who was the director of the Institute of Classical Studies at the University of London until his recent, excuse me, move to UCLA. Next slide, please. So that's the story of my story, a coin for the ferryman. Because the last two years have meant there has been very little book swag in circulation, I thought it would be fun to mint a real coin for the ferryman. Next slide, please. And here it is. If you would like to have one, I can't meet you at a conference. So if you would like to have one, please send me your uh, mailing address by email and I'll send you one. And don't worry, I will not use your address for anything else, I promise. Thank you so much. Thank you, Megan. That was great. Now we will hear from Tony Shiloh. Tony is a wife, mom, and multi-published Christian contemporary romance author. Her upcoming release, which you see here, is In Search of a Prince. Her earlier novels include Grace Restored, a 2019 Holt Medallion finalist, and the 2020 Sella Award finalist, Risking Love. As a member of the American Christian Fiction Writers Group, Tony loves connecting with readers and authors alike via social media. Learn more about Tony and her books at www.tonyshiloh.com. Welcome, Tony. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Tony Shiloh, the author of In Search of a Prince. Uh, next slide. I thought it'd be nice to talk a little bit about the research I did, or rather my writing process into In Search of a Prince. Um, I started with world building because I wanted to tell a story about a African-American woman who lives in New York City who finds out she's an, a princess to an African kingdom. So that first stop I had to do was figure out where I wanted to set um, my country because I wanted it to be fictionalized and give myself a little bit more creative license. So I researched the different African islands around Africa to discover which portion I wanted to set it in. I ended up looking into the colonization and the impacts that it had on the continent as well as the um, islands, and then also how that influenced the language and culture. I ended up um, choosing West Africa um, area, setting it in the Gulf of Guinea, um, a little bit because I thought it would go hand in hand with um, some DNA, uh, personal DNA research I did of my own background, and also because it just fit the idea I had of my story. Next slide. And then once I created my island, I went ahead and I created the cast of characters. I'm not a plotter, so I don't um, sit down and write what I think will happen in the story. It's more of where it, the setting is located and who are the people. Um, that's always how I go into a story. The characters tell me their story. And what I do is I look up um, what I think their person's name should be either because I think their name has meaning for a backstory purpose or um, because I just think it fits the character. And then I also delve into their strengths and weaknesses, um, what their occupation may be, how all of that ties into who they are, whatever um, adversity I think they'll face. In this case, um, Brielle Adebayo um, had to have a job that I thought would help her transition easily once she found out she was actually a princess. And um, of course her name, um, also I wanted it to be influenced by her background even though she didn't know it yet. And I always pick inspiration photos um, for my characters. It just helps uh, solidify their identity to me. It gives me a little uh, visual aid when I'm writing, I can refer to over and over. I have a huge Pinterest board for this story. Um, 
And that's just a little bit of my process. Next slide. I'm really excited. Um, I did um, go big with this story. Um, I gave everyone a fairy tale, uh, a story I wanted, a black princess. And I've been uh, blessed with accolades since. I've gotten a starred review from Library Journal. I've gotten great endorsements from authors like Vanessa Riley. She's the best-selling author of Island Queen. I've gotten um, endorsements from Becky Wade, another great Christian fiction writer. Um, and just recently, I um, saw a sneak peek at the book review from Booklist. Um, so it's great to see that everyone loves a story of a princess as much as I do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. Next up is Erin Bartles. Erin is the award-winning author of The Girl Who Could Breathe Under Water, All That We Carried, the 2020 Christine Christie finalist, The Words Between Us, and We Hope for Better Things, a 2020 Michigan notable book. Erin is a WFWA Star Award winner and a Christie finalist. A publishing professional for nearly 20 years. She lives in Lansing, Michigan with her husband, Zachary, and their son. You can find Erin online at erinbartles.com. Thank you for joining us, Erin. Thank you for having me. Um, I don't have any slides, so you can, there you go. <laughs> there I am. <laughs> um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about The Girl Who Could Breathe Underwater. It's the story of a woman named Kendra Brennan, who as a younger author, penned a debut novel that was quite closely based on her real life. And she thought she had changed enough of the details in order to you know, protect the innocent and the guilty. Um, and she is under contract to write her next book, but is finding it extremely difficult to concentrate on that because there is one letter that she got from an anonymous reader um, that seems to be from somebody who knows what happened. And they accuse her of getting the story wrong, of taking the wrong person's side, of using people, and all sorts of things that I don't think any author really wants to get a letter about. Um, so this is not based on my personal experience as an author, but there are a number of things in the story that are based um, or, or draw from some of my own personal experiences with failed friendships and um, sexual abuse. And so the topics are a little bit heavier in, in places, but it's all held, um, it's, it's dealt with quite sensitively. And um, so I don't think that, that should dissuade anyone. It's a really great book club book because of some of the things that happen. Um, so Kendra decides that in order to get over this and get beyond this letter and write the next book that she has to do, otherwise she has to return her advance, um, which she really can't afford she needs to find out the truth. Did she get the story right? Are her memories correct? And the only way to do that is to return to Hidden Lake, which is a fictional inland lake in Northern Michigan. Um, if you're familiar with Michigan, there's regular Michigan and then there's up North. And this is up North. And uh, the state is 40% water, which includes four out of five of the Great Lakes, but also tens of thousands of inland lakes. And so anybody who's from the Great Lakes area probably will connect with the idea of summering at a lake. And she spent all of the summers of her youth at this lake in her grandfather's cabin. And this is where she developed a friendship with a girl named Cammy and Cammy's older brother, Tyler. And that whole family is um, a really big part of the book, but also she, while she's up there trying to figure out what the truth is, she also will have an unexpected guest, which adds a little bit of romance and humor to um, the story. But what she ends up discovering as she's digging into these memories is that the truth is more complex than she remembered, just as you know, you, you might hear a song as a kid and think you know the lyrics, and then as an adult, you realize you got something wrong, and oh, this all makes more sense now that I know what it really says. And so that's kind of what this story is. It's her delving into this past, these past relationships and experiences and finding out what she missed. Um, it, talks a lot about themes of um, friends and enemies, truth and fiction, whether we can trust our memories, um, and also questions of when something bad does happen to you, what are you supposed to do with that? Uh, questions of revenge, justice, forgiveness, 
Um, and how do you move beyond something that seems like it's unforgivable and seems like it's defined your life? And how do you get to the point where you can trust people again and that you could actually truly love again? There's also a lot of um, interesting family relationships that get examined. And like I said, so this is a quite a good book club pick. Um, so if your library supports book clubs, um, it's, a, it's a really great way to um, get a lot of people reading. And um, it, it also is a story that it comes at things from a certain perspective. Um, it's Ravel is a Christian publisher, but this is not actually, I wouldn't say Christian fiction. So it's more of a women's fiction, um, book club fiction upmarket. So that's about the, the, the type of reader that you'd be looking for. I think that Christian readers would like it as well, but um, like the book of Esther, it doesn't actually mention God. So that might be something that somebody's looking for. It's good to know. Um, so anyway, uh, anything that connects with, especially female readers, uh, people who might have experienced intimidation or harassment or abuse in their past. And what's interesting is I've already talked to so many readers who immediately said, oh, this brought up so many memories and it really helped me think about what happened to me, even some of them more than 60 years ago um, and get beyond it and, and start thinking about things differently. So that's all I've got. Thank you so much. All right, very thoughtful. So our next panelist is Mecca Jamila Sullivan, and she is the Associate Professor of English at Georgetown, the author of Blue Talk and Love, winner of a Judith A. Markowitz Award for Exceptional New LGBTQ Writers from Lambda Literary. And welcome to the webinar, Mecca. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am Mecca Jamila Sullivan. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Booklist, for having me. I'm so excited to be part of this great conversation. Um, and I'm excited to share with you from my novel, Big Girl, which will be published by Norton Livewright in July. So this novel is set in Harlem, New York in the late 1980s and 1990s. And it follows Malaya Condon as she grows from a vivacious, big Black girl into a young woman. And as she does so, her various hungers clash with the inherited norms um, and family legacies that she's received surrounding womanhood, blackness, fatness, LGBTQ and queer desire, all set against the backdrop of a quickly gentrifying Harlem that's as sprawling and complex and as swiftly changing as Malaya herself. So I'm actually just gonna read a, a few moments from the novel. In this section, it's 1996 and Malaya is 15 years old. The scents of black coconut and African pear oils wafted toward Malaya from the tables that lined the street. As she walked, the smells of fried and jerk chicken, roti and rice pudding, platanos and candied yams seeped from the storefront restaurants, mixing together like the ingredients of a gumbo. They spilled over Malaya as she moved block after endless block, veering inward toward the new chain coffee shop on Lenox to make room for a hurried dreadlock man in a hoodie, then outward to avoid colliding with a cluster of children giggling in bubble jackets and scarves. She fingered the three purple braids that hung from her left temple and made games for herself as she walked, trying not to imagine what 125th Street thought of her, this double wide block of black girls streaked with color, bounding toward the big and tall men's section of Harlem jeans. The melody of TLC's newest ballad drifted across 8th Avenue. In the alcove between the Apollo Theater and Tsitsi's African hair braiding, a cassette bootlegger pumped Shaba Ranks' deepest reggae bass line into the street. Malaya could hear these songs blending with laughter, cat calls, arguments over the prices of African masks and homemade soaps. Children snickered as Malaya pushed through the crowd and an older man shouted, whoa, when she passed him, splaying his arms and making an exaggerated leap backward out of her way. But Malaya pushed through the blocks, her ears warmed by the foam pads of her Walkman, listening to her favorite song. She had discovered it two years ago in the eighth grade and claimed it immediately as her personal anthem, a first introduction to her newfound idol and kindred soul. It was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine. The track was an irresistible tale of rags to riches, chronicling the rapper's rise from blinding despair into unfathomable technicolor hope. The artist was a huge black man from Brooklyn with a lazy eye and a face as soft as chocolate frosting. 
His body puffed like a pouch of Jiffy Pop beneath his chin, and his voice was always thick and smooth, as though there were a scoop of ice cream perpetually lodged in his throat. Malaya loved the way this man told his success story, how he so prized the vestiges of hard living while casting the present as a gorgeous and unending feast. His album was full of the things that Malaya's mother, Naila, hated, and many of the things that her father, Percy, prized. Sex and death and hope and fantasy, all mixed together like a compote, baked into a hard but secretly sweet crust. Malaya loved the paradox of the rapper's moniker, Biggie Smalls, how it was intimidating and diminutive at once, how it said so simply so many of the things she'd been feeling these 15 years of her life. When Naila saw the CD, Ready to Die, lying among Malaya's Sharpie markers and gel pens, she arched her eyebrows and asked, so this is the message our artists are sending the youth now? But Percy only shook his head and said the album reflected a new generation's struggle and that it was their job as parents not to understand. Big woman, the cherry colored man at the bag check counter exclaimed as she cleared the threshold of the big and tall. He rounded his arms into a sumo wrestler pose. The acrid stink of new plastic bags smacked forth as Malaya pushed her way into the store. This man had become an uncomfortable acquaintance by now. He always looked friendly enough, but he had wet old eyes that seemed to catch on her body and drag away only full seconds after he spoke to her. I remember you. Do you have a husband? Yes, Malaya said plainly, taking the bag check ticket. I told you before. The man acted as though she hadn't spoken. So big, he continued, healthy, but you have a pretty face. I'll call you big girl, pretty face, he concluded, but his eyes raked her stomach. The comment was ridiculous and unoriginal and Malaya wanted to tell him so. She imagined her foot uprooted from its plot on the ground, striking the man's cheek way above the counter with a cartoon style, pow. Instead, she smiled politely and said, thank you, and put the ticket in her pocket. There were no mannequins in the big and tall men's section at the back of the store, only reams of logo stamped cloth folded twice back, elbows pinioned together, hems rolled three times under to gesture at normal man-sized forms. Malaya push, pushed past the Paco and Boss and Pele Pele racks toward the MC labels, which she'd chosen as her favorite a year ago when she made the twin discoveries that the brand both spelled out her initials with its logo and carried clothes in her size. She scanned the racks for a purple MC sweater and a pair of size 50 jeans, imagining herself sitting casually in a room that glinted with color and lights like a Hype Williams video, swaddled in richly dyed denim. She thought giddily about how the cuffs of the jeans would fold into the tongues of her Timberland boots like waves of soft serve ice cream into waffle cones, how tight and slick the look would make her feel. As she hovered beside the banks of oversized denim at the back of the store, a slim saleswoman with skin the color of Ritz crackers approached. Her eyes were warm at first, but when Malaya asked for what she wanted, the woman looked at her as though she had requested a side of creme fraiche with her McDonald's extra value meal. Um, they don't make big men's shirts in purple, she said, running a green acrylic tip nail over her hairline. And the biggest jeans we got is a 48. The woman handed Malaya the 48s as she struggled and suggested she try on a dingy velour sweater that reminded Malaya of tile grout instead. Malaya hadn't been weighed since the seventh grade when she had, and when she went to yet another specialist office at Naila's demand. The scale had stopped at 300 pounds and would go no further. That was three years ago. Malaya accepted the clothes and the sales girl sighed lightly behind her as she walked toward the fitting room. She squeezed herself through the fitting room doors. The walls there were covered with graffiti, tags, loo drawings, beeper numbers, and fragmented rhymes. She slid her headphones off, unlatched the button of her jeans, and felt her belly sigh into place. There was a strip of flesh around her middle that had been raked raw over the years by the constant rub of too tight denim, and now she felt the skinless strip sting. She pulled the 48s up, past her thighs and her hips, past her pillowy middle, the raw skin seething. She sucked in and tried to push the ends of the denim together, but they would not meet. She gulped a breath, tugged again, seethed over and over until water clung to her eyelashes and her face got hot. The biggest jeans we got is a 48. She fished a Sharpie from the pocket of her jacket and uncapped it, the sour smell boring into her nostrils. 
She angled her body against the wall and drew the tag she'd invented for herself. A sprawling letter M, blitzed with stars and topped with a crown, cocked boldly to the side like the rapper Biggie's hat. She stood there for a while, her ink wet on the walls, her eyes stinging as the sales girl sighed impatiently on the other side of the door. You good, ma'am? Yeah, she said, I'm okay. She tugged at the denim again. If the jeans would not give, she wished they would take and take until her body really became a separate thing from her smile, something she could leave there on the fitting room floor while she floated above the clothes, above the noise, above the expectant whine of the sales girl, away. She breathed in and let the denim fall, wishing she could suck up her skin, her fat, her muscle, and whatever it was that lay underneath those things, making her who she was, this person in this body, wedged between the two tight walls of the big and tall men's section, longing more than anything to feel small and slight and somehow like a girl. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mecca, for that powerful reading. That was transporting. And now we are so fortunate to have Shelby Von Pelt with us. Born and raised in the Pacific Northwest, Shelby now lives in the suburbs of Chicago with her family. Remarkably Bright Creatures is her first novel. Welcome, Shelby. Shelby, you're muted. I'm so sorry, like Zoom 101. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's fine. We all do it. Please you would think it's over. March March 2020 over here, like I've never done this before. Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, as I was saying, uh, just thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me here. This has uh, been really fun to listen to, to the, all of the panelists. Um, the question that I most often get about um, Remarkably Bright Creatures is how on earth I came to write a novel about an octopus. Um, and the answer really comes down to the internet, of course. Um, Several years ago, I saw a video that was uh, the Seattle Aquarium. Uh, I think uh, people that were visiting there had taken it. It was of an octopus that was trying to get out of its enclosure. And I just couldn't let go of it. I, I kept having the feeling that there was a character there. Um, and looking at subsequent videos of that same octopus, just the look on its face telling me that there is a character inside that octopus. Um, you know, he's, what must he be thinking? Um, that humans are so ridiculous that they can stop him from doing what he wants to do. Um, and then sometime later, I was in a writing workshop and was given this very simple prompt to uh, describe a character, um, an unconventional uh, point of view of a character. And my mind immediately went to that octopus. And uh, the, what I wrote in that writing prompt um, many years later became the first pages of this book. Um, I really just couldn't let it go. Um, next slide, please. I am what I like to, to call an armchair octopus scholar. I'm not a marine biologist, but I have spent a lot of time over the last few years learning about octopuses. Um, a, a lot of that time has been spent just in aquariums looking at octopuses. Um, I knew I wanted to write about a captive octopus, uh, so that's what I studied. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of wasted time there to spend a lot of time hiding back in their uh, little hidey holes. But when they do look back at you, it's, it's really a feeling like no other. Uh, they truly do stare back at you when you stare at them, um, which has always just made me feel like there's, there's something else in there, um, an intelligence, uh, which, you know, I think is, has been proven by research in recent years that uh, they are just fascinating creatures. Um, you know, I also had a lot of help from um, marine biologists at the Alaska Sea Life Center um, and at the Point Defiant Zoo and Aquarium, which is in my hometown of Tacoma, Washington, who uh, helped me bring Marcellus the octopus to life in a, it, it's always going to be fantastical, right? Because I'm, I'm giving him a voice, but I wanted his actions to feel real. I wanted there to be just that, just that one thing that I'm asking you to suspend disbelief on is that he can communicate with the reader. Um, and so I had a lot of help from them on, on really pinning down uh, the logistics there. The book Soul of an Octopus by Simon Montgomery is also was a fantastic nonfiction book that I read that had a huge impact on, on me as I was writing this. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, the main human character in the novel is a widow named Tova, and she works at this fictional aquarium, uh, mopping the floors just for something to do. Um, and she is partially based on my late grandmother, my grandma Anna, um, who had a lot in common with Tova. Uh, my grandma Anna was also an immigrant from Sweden. Um, she also liked to clean for fun. Uh, I've never met anyone who enjoyed cleaning so much as my grandma Anna. Um, and like Tova, after she retired, she took odd jobs cleaning like church basements just for fun. And she would often take me with her since she was uh, often in charge of watching me. Um, like Tova, my grandma Anna was very stoic. Um, she was an incredibly kind woman, um, but she had this shell around her that I never really saw crack. Um, and after gra my grandfather died, she was alone for like 15 years in her house, just like ironing her linens every Tuesday. And I think maybe part of me wanted to sort of rewrite her story um, in, in a different way. Uh, next slide, please. So I was very close to my grandmother as a child, and I was also kind of a weird kid who had a bedroom full of uh, snakes and lizards and all sorts of reptiles. So um, writing an animal story definitely came naturally to me. And the setting for the story, um, I mentioned earlier, the Point Defiant Zoo Aquarium in Tacoma, Washington, actually had a very round, very damp, very dark aquarium that is, is what the aquarium in my book is based on. It was one of my favorite places as a kid. I loved to go there. I think my parents hated it because I don't think it smelled very good inside. But, um, you know, I just always felt like it was so much more intimate than other parts of the zoo. Um, you know, like being inside was kind of like being let in on a secret with all these animals of the deep. And, um, you know, that this novel is in a way kind of a love letter to one of my favorite childhood places. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, Remarkable About Creatures is definitely a book about being stuck, um, as Tova is, and resigned to long-held misconceptions. Um, and it's also about getting unstuck. And I think, um, you know, writing this book in 2020 was definitely, you know, during the pandemic, helped me sort of get unstuck from a lot of things and brought me a lot of bright spots during a very dark time in being able to revisit some of the places of my childhood. Um, you can go to the next slide, and I think that's the last one, and uh, I will wrap up. Thank you so much, Shelby. And our final presenter for this part of the program is Virginia Stanley. Virginia is the Director of Library Marketing at HarperCollins Publishers. She has been with the company for over 30 years. She and her colleagues host a weekly Facebook Live program called Door to Door, where they interview authors and invite librarians to participate in the conversation by submitting questions during each episode. Featured guests have included Ann Patchett, Nikki Giovanni, Russell Banks, Anthony Horowitz, Jeffrey Archer, Sarah Bretzky, Kate Milgrew, and many more. Currently, there are over 500,000 views of Door to Door. If you'd like to join in the fun, follow Library Love Fest on their Facebook page. You can also catch the replay of every episode by going to YouTube and searching for Library Love Fest. Take it away, Virginia. Thank you, Donna. And thanks so much, everyone, for listening. I will be quick here so you can get back to the, the authors and the panel. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just housekeeping. You know to go to Library Love Fest and everything you want to do, sign up for our newsletters, get whitelisted for galleys. Everything can be done on librarylovefest.com, as well as the YouTube channel that was just mentioned. OK, next, please. Um, more of Library Love Fest. I'm just going to say next, next, next. And we'll go to the slides with door to door. I'm going to talk about that in one second. Tomorrow, it's typically on Tuesdays, but tomorrow we're going to have Kate Quinn and John Searles on our door to door show tomorrow, Wednesday at 2 p.m. There will be a link that will be sent to you tomorrow from Booklist. But all you have to do is go to Facebook Live to, um, I mean, uh, Library Love Fest's Facebook Live, Live page, and you can just get a reminder there. So that's tomorrow. Hope you can join us. Okay, and our listens on our podcast, wonderful. Keep going, please. 
And the first book up is Lessons from the Edge by Marie Yovanovitch. Uh, by the time she became US ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Yovanovitch had seen her share of corruption, instability, and tragedy in developing countries. But it came as a shock when in early 2019, uh, she was recalled from her post after a smear campaign by President Trump's personal attorney and associates. Um, her Courageous participation in the subsequent impeachment inquiry earned her the nation's respect and her dignified response to the president's attacks on our hearts. She has reclaimed her own narrative, first with her uh, lauded congressional testimony, and now with this memoir. This is not just another Trump tell-all. It's first and foremost a professional memoir by one of the most distinguished female diplomats to have worked in modern State Department. It's a coming of age and rising in the ranks as a woman in a nearly all-male uh, world, and it ends with a strong focus on the dangers that corruption poses to democracy at home and abroad. There are so many quotes uh, here, Madeleine Albright, Hillary Rodham Clinton, Adam Schiff, Amy Klobuchar, please pick this book up, it is so important. Next slide, please, is Her Last Affair. John Searles, as I mentioned, will be on our door-to-door -to -door tomorrow. His first, his last book was eight years ago, Help for the Haunted, made the inaugural library reads list. He is a terrific writer, a terrific speaker. This is character-driven suspense. Um, it's three uh, stories of three seemingly unrelated people intertwined to poignant and deadly effect. It's part thriller, part homage to film noir. It's really cool. Um, and it's an, a tense atmospheric story about the desperate desires of the human and heart and the lengths people will go uh, to for love. Um, so please do check this out tomorrow if you can meet John. Now the next slide is uh, Shelby Van Pelt's book. So Shelby has pretty much said everything that I would have said. I absolutely adore this book. Um, th there's not much I can say that she hasn't already said except that it will wrap its tentacles around your heart. It is so, so good. Um, and I will just say that uh, Shelby Van Pelt in her author's note says to gaze at an octopus and have it gaze back at you will make anyone wonder who the brighter creature is. It is a delicious read. Next is The Murder Rule by Dervla. Oh, oh, hang on one second. I lost my little spot here. Uh, Dervla McTiernan. This is a new standalone thriller and US hardcover uh, debut for one of Australia's most uh, eclectic thriller writers, often compared to Ruth Ware, Jane Harper. Uh, she's award winning number one bestseller. This is about a mother based in the United States, and it's about a mother who hides her secret past from her daughter, who's in law school and working on a case with the Innocence Project, an investigation that will lead the past and present to collide. The daughter is forced to reckon with the thin lines between justice and revenge, pri privilege and complicity, love and abuse. It's told in al alternating timelines the mother and the daughter stories twist and turn into ex explosive conclusion. If you love uh, Town of French or Lucy Foley, it's just a fabulous twisty uh, story with an end that I don't think you will see coming. Don uh, Winslow is a huge fan of hers and he just made this really cool little video um, on, on wrote about it on Twitter and how much he loves it. How am I doing on time? Okay, I think I have two minutes left. Okay. So Miss Chloe, A.J. Verdell, award-winning author, The Good Negress. This is her story about um, not only her friendship with Toni Morrison, but also invaluable writing and publishing insights. So the writing is spectacular. The reading line is, if you let a black girl loose in a library, you may not recognize the woman who emerges. Toni Morrison was born Chloe Wofford. She was this towering figure in the world of literature when she entered A.J. AJ Verdell's life. They had a literary friendship and it spun and it had highs and it had lows, but also, so while she talks about that, she also talks about the little known world of publishing. And so it's very interesting. If you are interested in either of these things, you are going to love this book. Two last books to talk about real quick. Uh, the Lock Room by Ellie Griffiths. Uh, she uh, is the author of the Ruth Galloway and the Magic Men mystery series, as well as the standalone novels, The Stranger Diaries, winner of the Edgar Award for Best Novel, The Postscript Murders. This is um, this is a Ruth Galloway um, mystery. It's a pandemic lockdown, and Ruth Galloway is feeling isolated from everyone but a new neighbor. Uh, her uh, it's three years after her uh, mother has died, and she's finally sorting through her mother's things, and finds a very curious relic, a decades-old photograph of her mother's Norfolk cottage with a with a peculiar inscription. So Ruth goes to the cottage, and uh, all hell breaks loose. I'll let it 
letting you have the fun and reading it, but that's The Lock Room by Ellie Griffiths, and it's just so twisty. And it's her 14th book, and it's a tearjerker, really, but uh, it, it's a great book that enjoys, it gives you a chance to enjoy more about Ruth's family history, so there you go. And then the last book, Time, last book, Littlest Library by Poppy Alexander. Um, paperback original, a heartwarming literary themed novel about a woman who turns an ordinary red phone box into a littlest library in England. That's a book for all of us. All right, that's it, thank you. Wow, that was great, Virginia, thank you. The Littlest Library, I love it. Okay, so um, it's time for us to have a conversation. I'm gonna turn on my video and welcome everyone, um, all our authors to join us. Um, so that we can see everyone. There we go. Hello, hello. So I'm going to try to ask you questions in the order in which you spoke, but um, feel free to jump in at any time. Um, let's start with uh, Megan. So I love that you described your novel, A Coin for the Ferryman, as an experiment. I wonder if you could talk about um, a little bit more about the paradoxes of time travel and what, what were the biggest challenges? You described some in your presentation. It really is a thought experiment to think about not only how an ancient person would feel suddenly plopped down into our world, but also how everyone who's dealing with him reacts. That surprised me more as I started <laughs> working on this story, that there were so many ethical considerations. Like, just because you can do this, is this something that you really should do? Because um, they sort of snap, they just kidnapped Julius Caesar. And um, he had no idea what was happening to him. I thought it, that made it sort of interesting because he's been warned on the Ides of March, beware the Ides of March. So he thinks when he's snatched to Southern California with that warning, that that's what the warning was about. Little does he know that when he gets back, the real the Warning was not about that. So there were those issues. And then there are inherent paradoxes when you do time travel. I was able to minimize those just by making it the way this time machine works is very restricted. It can only bring a person for a certain length of time and they have to go back right to the point where they were taken. And the scientist does everything he can to mitigate any changes in the person as he goes back. And he's also done tests that show him you really can't change subsequent events anyway. So he's pretty confident that this is a safe experiment. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so Tony, let's turn to you, a very different book, but highly imaginative. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the country you created um, and the, any details that you particularly enjoyed um, when you created the setting for your novel. Of course, I'd love to. Um, um, like I said earlier, I thought that creating an island would make uh, give me a little bit more creative license, but I did um, create it based off of a few things. Um, number one, I created off of Bioko Island, which is in the Gulf of Guinea. I just like the size of it, the look of it. Um, it was pretty when I saw it, um, some photos. So I used that for inspiration. Um, but then as far as like the history and the culture, I looked actually towards Nigeria. Um, more specifically, I looked at the Yoruba culture. It's where I, I basically based the language in the story off of. Um, and that was more, um, I don't know if I, I can't say nostalgia, it was more um, wanting to feel a kinship. Um, I did one of those DNA tests like everyone else mm -hmm. and a majority of my um, heritage comes from Nigeria. And so it's just kind of like, how would I feel if I discovered I was a princess, you know, do you, feel like you would have any kinship. Um, and so because of that, I looked at the culture, the food, um, the music, how um, they were influenced by colonization. Um, and then too, um, because I made it an island, um, I had to add in facts of, you know, how are they different from mainland Africa? Um, so that's one reason I was able to make them a monarch. Um, I let them have their um, independence earlier than a lot of um, mainland um, African countries did. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I did. Um, I also looked at uh, Seo Tome and Principe um, just because, you know, there's another island and I wanted to get that actual island feel added in there. Um, so it was a lot of fun looking at the different cultures in the area because they're so all vastly different. 
No, oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. This really makes the book even more enticing. Erin, you had very different challenges um, in your novel. And I wonder if you could talk about, I, I was really struck in your presentation that you said that people really related to the experiences that you addressed. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about writing about such sensitive matters and um, what you hope to accomplish. Sure, yeah. Um, so there are some scenes that are drawn specifically from my own personal experience of um, as a child, I was nine when I uh, was sort of harassed and, and um, molested by a friend's older brother. And um, I actually started really working on this book when I found that that friend had died young and in likely tragic circumstances. And I started thinking about how, you know, I, I put up with things to a point and then I stopped going over to her house and I stopped being friends with her because I didn't want to be around her brother. And then I started thinking about well, what if other people did that? What if all of her friends left her? And that's when the, the idea for this book really came to um, be a point where I could actually write it as a whole novel. And it wasn't just, you know, me sort of navel gazing and, and exploring my own experience, but um, I think, I think it's just largely the realization that these things don't happen in a vacuum and they affect a lot of different relationships. And so I wanted to explore that. I wanted to explore, um, you know, how you, how you get beyond that, but also how you stop focusing on yourself. Because at any, any time something bad happens to you, the first natural question is why and why me? <laughs> And I actually have had the opportunity to ask my own abuser, like, why? Why did you do that um, when we connected later in life? And um, he didn't have a good answer. And then later on, when my friend died, I started thinking about the age that her brother was and some other things that had happened in our town. And really the, the turning point came when I, met, I finally told my story to my sister and a, a close childhood friend. And both of them have worked in social work and both of them immediately said, I'm so sorry that happened to you. I wonder what happened to him. Mm -hmm. And it had never occurred to me to ask that question. And the, you know, behavior like that doesn't come out of nowhere. So, so one of the things I wanted to do was like really look into what makes a person do terrible things to another person and how can everyone get past it? I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. well you, you bring up so many important aspects, especially empathy and compassion, um, you know, even for people that have done harm, um, and which you know, I think fiction really helps all of us access. That. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I think, one of the things that she really explores, or the book really explores, because she is somebody who's supposedly creating these fictions, you know, writing these books. But, right. um, you know, how much of what all of us write, uh, even just talking uh, on this panel, we can tell that there are personal parts of our lives that are in all of our books. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. We'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, Mecca, let's, let's talk about Harlem. That, what you read was so incredibly vivid. I wonder if you could <laughs> talk about all those details that anchor us in a place and in a time. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm from Harlem, New York. Um, so that certainly is, you know, dovetailing on what Erin has just said. That setting is, you know, is a place that is really sort of important to me. It's the, the backdrop of my own coming of age. And, you know, Harlem is one of the sites of kind of early gentrification at the close of the 20th century. So, you know, sort of by the 1990s, you know, mid 1990s, Harlem gentrification was really sort of picking up speed. And that was happening at the same time as, you know, for me, hip hop culture is sort of becoming more commercial. There are lots of sort of changes that coincided with my own coming of age. I've always been interested in, in the notion of sort of being from a place and also sort of at a remove from it enough to kind of be aware of the ways in which that place impacts the character or, you know, if it's the self, right, sort of how being in it but not of it or sort of in a kind of complex relationship to a place that is itself also shifting and changing. That to me was just so fascinating as a site of a kind of coming of age story. For a character like Malaya, for whom the changes of her body sort of consume her entire world and her worldview and how she sort of, how the, the people around her react to her. That too, I think is, you know, there's a kind of metaphorical resonance there with Harlem, how the perceptions of a neighborhood like Harlem have changed over time as its, you know, its popularity has grown. Um, you know, Harlem is well known as a kind of, you know, has for its literary history um, and its history as a kind of cultural 
you know, sort of birthplace of several cultural movements. And at the same time, in the 80s and 90s, it also was very much sort of known as a site, a major site of the crack epidemic, like, you know, lots of violence, you know, ongoing sort of confrontations with state violence and policing. And so that complexity was something that I thought was sort of really rich and interesting um, and was a perfect way to kind of get at the inner changes and complexities of this character in her relationships to the world around her. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you so much. So when we go turn to Shelby and your book, we're in a completely different world um, of the, the books under discussion today. Yours is the most sort of interspecies um, <laughs> relationships and setting. You talked a little bit about your love for animals and especially creepy crawlies as a girl. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, you know, the importance of nature, you're looking at animals in captivity, but that's how a lot of us meet them. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about interspecies connection. Well, I think, um, I think for my main character, Tova, um, like I said, she's very stoic. She has the shell around her and she just, she doesn't want to be a burden on anyone. And she has a real difficulty connecting with people in her life. Um, and it's not until she has this moment with an octopus that she kind of starts to break open a little bit. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I've, I've been in, um, involved in animal rescue for a long time. I've, I've always had cats. Like I would have 10 million if my husband would let me, um, but he won't sadly. Uh, and there is something really, there's a connection that is different when you gain an animal's trust. Um, and I think Tova experiences that for the first time in this book. And I think it helps her kind of be, you know, become more human, it helps her realize that she can tap into um, things from her past and she can deal with them instead of just shutting them away and pretending that everything is okay. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't think that she would have been able to do that with a human being. It had, had to be an octopus in my book anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting. Uh, thank you, Shelby. Um, so Megan, we, we roll back to you in this uh, round of questions. And I can't help but be interested in your classics background. And I wondered, has that played a role in any of your other books or will it play a role in future books? It has played the biggest role in this book for obvious reasons. But, um, you know, it's funny. Um, I studied Greek and Latin in college and I studied archaeology as well. And I spent time in a semester in Rome and a summer in Athens. And later I lived in Greece for a year and taught there. So I, I was I really was you know, kind of marinated in <laughs> classical culture and languages. And I loved it. I mean, and so now, because I didn't go on with it, I didn't go on academically in that field. I, um, I just consider it my operating system. Because <laughs> what you learn about language in general from studying those languages, Latin and Greek, um, it just, it helps in so many ways. It's helped my writing and all sorts of things. So I know that it colors how I see the world just because I spent all that time doing it, even though I no longer study it much, except, well, I had to figure out what Julius Caesar was actually like as a person, which was, it's kind of freaky. I mean, that freaked me out the most. I had plenty of other characters to develop as well, but he, getting in his head, it was just kind of frightening because some people consider him a mass murderer. And yet, you know, more commonly, he's thought of as a statesman and a general, but, um, and then I thought everyone has their idea of what Julius Caesar is like. So maybe they aren't going to like what I think he might be like. And how would he really act when confronted with Caesar's palace? <laughs> so again, the thought experiment took hold. But I do think, to, just to answer your question, that classics background, it, it's just so much a part of me that it's there. <laughs> and also, oh, my metaphors are always about Greek mythology. <laughs> Great. I love that description of an operating system. That's, that's great. Um, so Tony, you mentioned that you enjoyed creating this island so it could have a monarchy. I'm struck by how many romance novels love royals and situations with royals. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your interest in royals and, and why you think those stories are so appealing to us. That's a great question. Um, I think that royals and their self have a romantic air about it, which lends great when you're writing romance, um, because you have an idealistic view. You think, you know, they have this great life. 
Um, everything must come easy to them. Um, obviously, they can have a happily ever after more than a, a person who's from a middle class or poverty background. I think it's sort of like Megan said, you just do your own thought experiment, like what would it be like um, living a life of a royal, um, especially since my character, um, she's a civics middle school teacher when she finds out she's actually a princess and a royal. Um, and for me, myself, I don't know, I think it kind of also goes hand in hand with the fairy tales I grew up listening to, the Beauty and the Beast, um, all of those. Um, just the thought of becoming a princess, feeling like your troubles could not only, um, you could not only overcome them, but you could find um, true love in the process, I think is what I wanted to give to myself, but as an adult. <laughs> Well, let's not forget the clothes. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Erin, I was very intrigued when you gave your um, talk about talking about how your novel didn't necessarily come under the inspirational fiction head, heading, that it had a, a wider appeal. And I wonder if you could talk, I, I find this is interesting in, um, at Booklist when we review books, you know, you, they're from a certain publisher, so you expect them certain things. And yet, of course, each book is different and individual. And I wonder if you could talk a bit, you've written uh, books that you probably do describe as inspirational and and uh, your new one who isn't. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and the appeal they have. Sure. Yeah. And actually, I don't think I don't think I would describe most of my books as inspirational. I mean, inspirational in a general sense, but um the reason uh, the books that come from my publisher are categorized Christian fiction is not necessarily their content. The content's going to be clean. There's not gonna be any swearing, um, but you know, in this book and others that I've written, there's drinking, there's smoking, there's bad things going on. Um, and I know that a lot of people who are used to um, the sort of traditional genre of Christian fiction find that a little bit strange. And um, I have readers who are surprised to find that it's Christian fiction, and then readers who are disappointed to find that it's Christian fiction, like I duped them somehow. Um, but the reason it's it's labeled that is because of the publisher that it comes from. So when you're putting bisex on a book, if it's from a certain publisher, you have to put that on there. And so my books are really more broad than maybe the, the sort of traditional sense of Christian fiction. But I think that when you think of, um, books before there was a Christian fiction section, because that's a relatively new uh, development in, in the history of, of books. There's tons of stuff out there that comes from uh, a Christian worldview that wouldn't be labeled that. You know, so Marilyn Robinson's a Christian, but she doesn't write Christian fiction. She just writes fiction. <laughs> and just like a, a, a female author writing about female protagonists, sort of automatically is writing women's fiction when if it was a man, it would just be general fiction. Um, so it, they do have crossover appeal. Um, they definitely, uh, everything I write has some sort of question of, you know, um, bigger, the sort of big questions. I did write a book that was a little bit more spiritual, I think, um, all that we carried that dealt with, you know, what happens after you die? Is there a God? Am I gonna see my parents again? That sort of stuff. But more broadly, they deal with things that all people deal with, no matter what your faith is. Um, so you have to reckon with things that go wrong in your life. And is there a plan? Isn't there? Is it all just chaos? Um, how do I forgive? How do I move on? How do I treat other people? Um, so, so I would say they're, they're in that section because of the publisher. <laughs> Um, and, and people on either end of the spectrum will definitely find things that they uh, really like about them and they will find things to complain about. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Oh, that's helpful. And I, I think there's been a, a great evolution and kind of opening in, um, from these publishers too and what they publish. So. Yeah, I think that I was um, sort of taken on as a guinea pig. <laughs> Let's see if this works. An experiment? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. Thank you. Well, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a challenge for... Um, you know, book review editors and librarians, you know, to place books until you know what's going on and you get some kind of feedback. And then it doesn't matter. You just recommend books to readers who will appreciate them. Um, so thank, thank you, Erin. Um, Mecca, let's, let's go back to uh, your novel. I keep thinking about your title, Big Girl, and um, the scene you read where um, Malaya is a, a big woman in a small space. And I'm also thinking about um, 
how small people feel um, when they're marginalized for various reasons. So I wonder if you could talk about um, your protagonist and, and why she is who she is. Mm, thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, one of the kind of the, the plot threads that's happening in this novel is it, it is Malaya's sort of quest to really sort of claim and enjoy and appreciate her bigness, right, her size, and understand the various ways in which she is in fact big, right, that it, her body is big and she comes to sort of accept and, and, you know, sort of appreciate her body for that. And also that her size and the sort of space taking possibility she holds is beyond the limits of her body as well. And this is a lesson that she ends up needing to sort of teach the people around her too, because she comes to sort of see how that sort of um, the fear of taking up too much space of being too big is in fact inherited across generations of women specifically in her family. But I think we can also think about how sort of disobedient bodies in general, the fat bodies, the black bodies, the women's bodies, the trans bodies, disabled bodies are all sort of trained to take up less and less space. And there's a way in which you know, if we don't sort of question, you know, if we don't sort of make our own intervention and say, wait a minute, I'm going to name some of these trainings, name the shame, and make a decision to do things differently, it's very easy to sort of replicate and continue to reproduce those, you know, those feelings and those ideas across generations. So for Malaya, big absolutely means, you know, her body is big, but also her imagination is vast, her, you know, the world around her is big, her access to it, and certainly her possibility is big. And this is what she comes to understand over the course of the novel. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, so Shelby, coming back, I'm, I'm thinking about Octopus. And um, I love Simon Montgomery's book as well. And it's fantastic. Um, that, <laughs> oh, she's great. And that it's so it's surprising. I mean, the animals we relate to the most readily are mammals because they're most like us. Um, or perhaps birds because you know we, we see them. Um, but sea creatures, the deep shy sea creatures like octopus are, are very difficult to relate to. So I wonder if you could talk about how, how you made a character out of this animal and, um, and what sort of, how you got into an octopus mind. I, I think for, for me as, you know, as, as a creative writer trying to make a character out of an animal um, with octopuses, it, it always started with their eyes for me. And mm -hmm. that comes up over and over again in the book, that, that connection you know, that Tova and eventually others um, would have with him through, through his eyes. Um, just this, there's something otherworldly about them. It, it comes up a lot. Um, and I think they, you know, I said this earlier, but they, they look back at you. There is a curiosity there that sometimes, so, often is there with other animals. Um, but I think with octopuses and, and with other animals like them, I think, you know, dolphins um, come to mind as animals that have demonstrated curiosity about us as a species. Um, but it's just, you know, in my experience of, of observing octopuses and, you know, I think in, in Cy Montgomery books too, there is just something about their curiosity and their connection and their seeing of us um, that is extraordinary. Um, I think, you know, so speak, big, big, big people, small people, Tova in my book is a, is a very, very small person and she, intentionally makes herself small. Um, she, you know, wants to take up no space in the world. She doesn't want to burden anyone. She feels bad if someone drops off a casserole on her porch. Like she just, you know, be before she sort of goes on her journey, almost wills herself not to exist, not to take up any space. And so for her, when she gets this connection with Marcellus the octopus, you know, in my mind, that's her really being seen for the first time. And that's that connection that comes about with, um, with, with the eyes and the eye contact that they have, um, which, you know, I think is just something kind of magical and in fitting of a book that is a little bit magical. You know, it's just a little, 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 little touch of fantasy um, on top of an otherwise realistic story. Oh, that's great. That's great. Thank you. So in thinking about your books and, and um, things we've been talking about, the one question I think that um, we, you can all address is about research. Um, you each talked a little bit about it, but I'm thinking about the last couple of years. I don't know how long people were working on their books, maybe before the pandemic, but I guess I sort of even beyond these current books, wanted to ask you about research and the role of libraries in your, in your reading and writing life, if, if that's something we could talk about. Um, Megan? 
libraries, oh, research? I made a huge discovery while working on this book because I had to come to Las Vegas, which was not a place I had ever felt drawn to particularly. But one of my earliest discoveries was the wonder, wonderful libraries that are here. There are so many. They've, they're all different. The buildings are all unique. They were all designed by different architects. And so it was just, you know, as someone who knew no one in Las Vegas, the library was my first way to connect. And it has remained that because is that surprising that Las Vegas has beautiful and plentiful libraries? It was to me. I mean, it shouldn't be. It's a big city. There are like almost 3 million people here. But, um, but somehow you just don't associate books with Las Vegas. And yet there it was. And, and that's how I could actually have a main character who could learn to speak Latin in a Las Vegas high school, because there are several schools that have various programs like that that teach Latin. And also the International Baccalaureate program is here and other things that I just really, Las Vegas, I didn't expect to find. So, so she has, actually is a plausible character, even though people find her unbelievable that a Las Vegas cocktail waitress could speak Latin. She does, but those, those libraries, please, if you come to Las Vegas, visit a library or two. They're really beautiful and they have wonderful meeting rooms and theaters and of course, a fabulous staff of terrific librarians. Oh, I love hearing that. Yes, and, and you know, we know better than to think that someone working as a cocktail waitress wouldn't also uh, love to read and, and do other intellectual things. How many of us have worked weird jobs to put ourselves through school? Okay. <laughs> Um, Aaron, libraries, research. Oh, I'm sorry. I got no, do you want to do Tony first? Yes, Tony. <laughs> sorry. It's okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I actually wrote this during um, the start of the pandemic. So uh -huh. obviously I couldn't jet off to Africa or anything. So definitely use the library. Um, I'm a big fan of Hoopla and um, Overdrive now, um, especially since the pandemic, we couldn't actually go in um, for a certain period of time um, into the library. So using the um, apps to still be able to borrow books and find out all the questions I needed was a huge blessing. Yes, yes, thank you. I um, had the same experience in Chicago. I've just come to absolutely love Chicago Public Library website. You can do incredible things on there. and. Uh, borrow ebooks and have things put on hold for you. It's remarkable. Erin? Um, okay, so with this book, I actually really didn't need to do any research because it's based on a real place and I'd been spending a lot of time there. And, you know, so, but for other books, I've done a lot of research. Um, my debut had historical timelines and I did a lot of research. Um, my problem is that I write in books and so I can't get my research books from the Ooh. library because I feel like you guys might frown on that. Um, and I, I underline and write in all of my books uh, that I use for research, so I have to buy them. <laughs> but I love doing events with libraries. <laughs> I consider to you not to uh, mar library books. Uh, I, I have the experience where I check things out from the library and have that same impulse, so then I have to buy the book anyway. Uh, it's great to start with the library. Um, Mecca, how about you, research libraries? Yeah, same. I totally have that sort of urge to write in books. And so I check them out and then, you know, buy them when it's time to really kind of go in and, you know, get in there. So this novel I worked on while I was working on a PhD in English literature. Um, and the dissertation was very separate. Well, in, in some ways, at least, was distinct, a distinct project from this novel. So I, you know, spent many years in libraries working on that project. And that really helped me sort of um, connect with the world of, of creative writing and, and sort of literary production, just spending time in the stacks, the discovery that happens sort of as you, you know, you, you're there to sort of seek out a, a, a particular book, but you see everything that's next to it. For me, the PS and PN sections, you know, sort of falling in love again with the work of the writers that I most admired from a creative standpoint while I was working on this literary scholarship and literary theory was hugely transformative. But I think the role of libraries actually kind of predates even that for me in the sense that, you know, the, the moment that I really sort of realized that I could be a writer really happened when I was kind of perusing and, and maybe snatching titles from my mother's personal library. I was in the fifth grade and I read Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye um, and I came across the works of Antozaki Shange and you know little this little corner of our home that was very clearly designated the library and that's when I realized that you know a young black girl's life could be a thing to write about and that somebody like me could make a life 
writing about the experiences of Black girls and Black women and Black queer people. Um, and that, you know, that changed my life and sort of shaped everything going forward. So I feel deeply indebted to libraries and librarians as well for sort of everything that they offer us as writers and readers. Oh, thank you. I, I'm very impressed by your two, two sides of the brain working on that dissertation and fiction. It's very impressive. Um, Shelby, how about you? Um, well, we moved um, about a year before the pandemic started uh, to our current town of Wheaton, Illinois, which is in the Chicago suburbs, but a much smaller town out to the west here. Um, we were in Atlanta previously, and I had gone to the library in Atlanta, uh, but it was a big library system, and it was great. Um, but there's something about kind of a smaller town library. I mean, it, there's just one here. Um, it's like the library, and it's in our little downtown. And um, it, it was my office, um, you know, I would go there and set up with my laptop and my headphones and write um, when I needed to just, especially in the aftermath of moving, you know, there's boxes everywhere. You can find a million reasons not to write when you're in the middle of trying to get settled. Um, so I would spend hours and hours in my, my, my table and I had my coworkers, you know, there was a whole little group of us that did this every day. Um, and it's just been, my, my kids love the library. We go there at least once a week. It's just a, um, you know, it doesn't, it's a smaller library. I don't know that I used that library in particular for research on this book. Um, but we, I mean, at any given time, we have probably like 30 library books in our house. We are there all the time. Um, my kids love it. And I really am looking forward to the day when I can move from the corner of my living room where I am now and have a change of scenery sometime. I mean, I guess I could now, but we're kind of waiting until, you know, just waiting until things die down again. Um, but, you know, big, big thumbs up for this, the kind of smaller town library for me. It's been such a, a nice landing place for us after moving here. Oh, it's so great to hear. Thank you all. Thank you so much. I just figured out between the different clocks I have in front of me that we're pretty much out of time. That was a wonderful conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it was such a pleasure to speak to everyone. Um, tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's slide presentation, title list, certificate of completion, and video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, please visit us at booklistonline.com slash webinars, as you see here. There you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like these. They're all going to be great. Not yet a subscriber? Why not? Pair the print reading experience with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com. You can lock in print, online, digital, and archive access by taking advantage of the special webinar offer to get Booklist and Booklist Reader and everything else for only $75. It's a huge deal. Please join us. And patron-friendly, librarian-improved, free with a Booklist subscription. We are so proud and excited about Booklist Reader Booklist's new digital-only magazine highlighting diverse readers' advisory recommendations for all ages. Here it is. To see and share the latest issue, visit us at booklistonline.com slash reader hyphen issues. It's great for your patrons. It's really a fun um, re reuse of all our great materials. Join us. Oh, and this is very exciting too. You know, it's LibLearnX this weekend. Um, join us for the 2022 Book and Media Awards this Sunday, January 23rd at 4.30 p.m. Central Time. We will unveil the year's best in fiction, nonfiction, poetry, audiobook, and reference materials. This will include the Andrew Carnegie Medals for Excellence in Fiction and Nonfiction, sponsored by novelist, booklist, and Russo. We hope to see you at Lip Learn X and see you at the awards. Thank you again for joining us for this very special webinar. One more huge thank you to our authors and to our sponsors, Ibrafex Books, Stephanie House Publishers, Ravel, Live Right, W. w. Norton, and HarperCollins Publishers. Thank you, Mecca, Tony, Aaron, Shelby, and um, who did I leave out? Oh, Megan, <laughs> thank you all. See you next time, everyone. Stay well.